100% natural, no additives. Andrew Farley is celebrating your freedom in Christ. Call in and ask your questions at 877-956-9566. That's toll free at 877-956-9566. Via satellite from Texas, it's The Grace Message with Dr. Andrew Farley. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Grace Message. I'm Andrew Farley. So glad you're joining us today. That number, 877-956-9566. We've got wide open lines, plenty of room for you to get in with your question. Maybe you've got a question about a scripture passage. Maybe you heard something in church uh, just this morning and you're still scratching your head wondering about it. Hey, let's make it a conversation together right now, 877-956-9566. Wide open lines, three open lines right now. Plenty of room for you to get in with your question. Maybe you've got a personal problem going on in your life right now, in your marriage, with your kids, in your church. Uh, You're looking for that grace message perspective. Well, that is exactly why we're here for the next hour for you, toll free across the United States and Canada. I'll give you that number again, 877-956-9566. And if you're a first-time caller today, you got to know we love it. We love to hear from our first-time callers. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're a veteran listener, uh, maybe you've already called us in the past, but it's been a while, you've got something brand new on your heart this afternoon, by all means, uh, join us as well. Again, wide open lines, lots of opportunity uh, right now for you to get in. And if you're live streaming with us on on Facebook or YouTube, of course, uh, you're welcome to call in and be a part of today's conversation as well. Again, that number one more time, 877-956-9566. All right, we're going to start out today in Georgia, and we'll talk with Kyle. Hey, Kyle, what do you got for us today? Hi, Drew. I, I guess now I need to call you my Paul of Dallas <laughs> since you switched over to Dallas, Texas. Uh, two quick questions. The first one, uh, how was it uh, when you told your congregation in uh, Lubbock uh, that yeah. you know you were coming to Dallas. I mean, I yeah, I know if you and you are my pastor, by the way. Hmm. But um, you know, physically, I wasn't actually in your church in Lubbock. But I right. imagine that uh, yeah, that your congregation had to be pretty sad about that. Okay, yeah, I'd I'd love to talk and about it, that. And then, what's your second one? Second question is, you know, Jesus praying to the Father in the garden, and he says, Father. Um, you know, and I, I'm sure I'm not saying this exactly, but he wanted us to be in him just as, uh, or be in them, be in us. Yes. And he used the word us. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it's my understanding, you know, it's the father and the son, but the Holy Spirit not, does the Holy Spirit play its own specific role in our lives or? Okay. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, First, uh, I'm delighted to say uh, our congregation in West Texas is stable and strong. I was there last week, so I, on a regular cycle, uh, visit West Texas and continue to preach there throughout the year uh, on a regular cycle. So about every seven to eight weeks, I will go there. That's the plan we came up with uh, from the start, Kyle. And I mean, it seems to me the room was as full as it's ever been. It's amazing. We're two months in, two months into this transition to Dallas. And I think that's just a testimony to the message. It's not uh, about the messenger. It's about the message. It's about the community. And it's about rallying around Jesus. And we have one another and belong to one another. So, We put a lot of people in place to help our community before I moved to Dallas, Texas, and they're going strong. Uh, And, I mean, there were tears shed when I went back this past week. I cried. They cried. We hugged. We talked. We caught up on everything that's happening in Dallas with our church plant. It was beautiful. It was emotional and beautiful and much needed. Um, and uh, and we're doing great. So that's all I can say. It's a, it's a testimony to the message of God's grace 
anytime you build a message around one person and they leave, uh, then you're probably headed for disaster. But if you build uh, your life around Jesus Christ himself and the message of his grace, well, then you've got an identity that's rooted and grounded um, in something that can never be taken and never be shaken. So we're pretty excited to be here in Dallas with our second location. Uh, for those of you who are listening from Dallas, uh, we want you to know we're in Farmer's Branch. We're located in Farmer's Branch, and uh, we've got a service every Sunday morning at 1030, 1030 a.m. on Sundays. And if you want to find out more about us, uh, you can go to thegracechurch.org. It's that simple. That's easy to remember, thegracechurch.org. And also, you can live stream with us. If you're at a distance, you can, of course, uh, join in on our online church community and be part of that. Again, you can find out everything you need to know at thegracechurch.org. But I love your question, the Holy Spirit. He, not, not an it, but he. Uh, he's a person. The Godhead, the Trinity, three in one. And you've got a John 15, which is basically the vine and branches uh, analogy. And it's, it's us in him and him in us. And we're dependent and we're just a branch. We're not the vine and we're frail and we're weak and we're human, but we're meant to be dependent upon someone who is strong. And then in John 17, you have this beautiful uh, prayer where Jesus is talking to the Father and he says that they would be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe uh, that you sent me. And then he goes on, he says, the glory that you've given to me, uh, I have given to them. Uh, so we're always trying to give glory to God, and apparently he gave his glory to us. That's pretty awesome to think about. So then he says, Father, those whom you have given me, May they be with me where I am. So notice that God gave Jesus a present, and you're that present. God gave Jesus a gift, and you're that gift. So it's pretty cool to think about uh, just that you are a gift from the Father to the Son. And with that in mind, uh, we have a, a situation where uh, we get to wake up every day and say, Wow, wow, thank you for letting me participate and thank you for looking at me as a gift, and you cherish me, and you treasure me, and uh, I'm your child. And as far as the Holy Spirit, I mean, you see that in the Gospel of John, that topic comes up. Uh, he's our comforter. He's our counselor. But let's be clear. Uh, you're in the Father, and you're in the Son, and you're in the Spirit. And then the Father is in you, and the Son is in you, and the Spirit is in you. So keep in mind, it's truly in us, that in us concept. You're right. I mean, Jesus is referring to the Trinity in the plural. He says that they may be in us. So that's why, Kyle, that's why I like to say wherever you go, there's four of you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you. You're never alone. Uh, the entire Trinity is pleased to have you. All right, well, let's go now uh, to Maryland, and we'll talk with Viola. Hey, Viola, what's on your heart today? Hey, how you doing, uh, Pastor Andrew? Great. Uh, I'm doing good, too. Good. Uh, I, I really don't have a, a question question. Okay. I just want to uh, thank you for your ministry, for the uh, grace message that's been, uh, been a part of my life ever since I've been listening to you, which was three or four years ago. I got mm. your books, and I read them every day, and I get a more understanding of who I am in Christ, and mm. I, I just feel free. I just I just thank you for that message, because it was always confusing to me anyway as I was growing up about salvation and Christianity, because I'm, I'm 74 years old and baptized at 12 years old and joined mm. the church and all, but I was always confused. Anyway, having said that, I just, I just want to— Thank you for, the, for for sharing the truth. I wish more preachers would do it. I wish they would come out of that, um, I don't know, that uh, uh, bondage they in. Been in for years. I went to a home-going service yeah. yesterday of yeah. a lady 85 years old. Mm -hmm. 
and me, me and that lady was was born and, and and raised in West Virginia, and she was always in the church. I'm in my seventies. She was eighty five when she, you know, when she passed. Yeah. But she was in the church. She played the piano, and and you know, was saved, I guess. Yeah. But the preacher said, when she came to D.C. area, say she she finally got baptized in the name of Jesus and speaking in other tongues and. It, it was like he was saying she just got saved when she right. came to that church. And, you know, some people believe that. Right. They, right. You know, they believe it's just so sad. I listen to that. I say that means that means when she was in West Virginia going to church, she she, she didn't know Jesus. Jesus mm. wasn't in West Virginia. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, Viola. Well, uh, first, thank you. Thank you for the encouragement. Uh, it's, it's so good to hear from you again. And I'm glad that you've been connected with us now for some three years, it sounds like. Uh, that's a good long time. We're grateful for your friendship, for your support, for your prayers, uh, for your connection with us. And you always have great questions when you call. Uh, so I think you are asking a question. I mean, essentially, uh, you're saying, why is this out there? Uh, this idea that somehow you can uh, be in Christ and be in the church as part of the church, perhaps, but then it gets confusing when somebody uh, communicates a very uh, odd message of, but wait a minute, you're not really right with God until you speak in tongues. You're not really right with God until you're baptized in water. You're not really right with God until you do things our way. Because that's what I'm hearing. I mean, with all the denominations out there, all the movements that have a sign on the door and a label in terms of denomination, you're going to find, you know, 50 different denominations and 50 different teachings. And some of those teachings, not all, of course, but some of them can be very misleading about what it means to be right with God. And when it comes to rightness with God, we have to major in the majors. I mean, Ephesians says, for by grace you are saved through faith. It doesn't say through tongues. It doesn't say through prophecy. It doesn't say through the same gift that the guy up front has. It says you're saved by grace through faith. Now, you'll also notice there's no mention of, of water baptism in that passage. I love a good water baptism. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we baptize people in water in our church. We celebrate salvation that way. We do it in remembrance of Christ and all that he's done for us. Uh, but nothing new is happening that day. Those people are not gaining a new status with God. I mean, the purpose of baptism is in remembrance. It's just like the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is fantastic. I love to celebrate that. Uh, but we don't celebrate it to cause something new to occur. It is done in remembrance of Christ and in remembrance of his finished work. So as you raise that glass to your lips and you drink that wine or the Welch's, whatever it is that you choose to consume, you're remembering that Jesus shed blood. But you're not going to get any more forgiven in that moment. You're not going to get any more cleansed in that moment. Uh, you are already a forgiven and cleansed person if you are in Christ, but now it's time to party. What do I mean? Well, that's exactly what the Lord's Supper is. It's a party. It's a celebration. And so is water baptism. It's a beautiful party. So that's why you can read in the book of Acts, you know, Peter is astonished that these Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit just as the Jews have. And he says, what prevents them from being baptized in water? In other words, they're already saved. They already have the Spirit. They're already right with God by grace through faith. Now, let's party. But he wasn't saying, let's go down to the river to get them right with God. He was saying, what prevents us from partying? These are saved people. So let's celebrate. Let's, uh, just like at the Lord's Supper, raising your glass to heaven and toasting the finished work of Christ, let's go down to the river, put someone down into the water, and raise them up. And that is done as a celebration, a party, if you will. So 
it's just like a birthday party. I mean, does getting a having a birthday party over there at Chuck E. Cheese does that make you born? No, you're celebrating a birth uh, that's already taken place. You got your buddies there. You're five years old. You're eating pizza and playing video games and watching puppets, and you're having a party because you were already born five years ago. It's a birthday party, not a birth. Likewise, when you have a wedding anniversary, uh, you're celebrating your anniversary with your spouse, but you're not getting married. It's done in remembrance of already being married. So it's the same with the Lord's Supper. It's the same with water baptism. We're celebrating a new birth. We're celebrating a marriage to Christ. We are the bride of Christ spiritually by grace through faith. So what you heard there, you know, I don't know that person's life, but what you heard at the funeral, assuming they had already come to Jesus, they had already called upon the Lord to be saved, then the last thing we want to be telling people is that this person got right with God near the end because of their church attendance or water baptism or speaking in tongues. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's not what makes you right. You're not right by logging time in a building. You're not right by logging time in the water. And you're not right by logging time speaking other languages. You're right because Jesus logged time on the cross. You're right because Jesus logged time rising from the dead and giving his life to you. So that's what makes us right before God. And when it comes to speaking in tongues, it seems like we've hand-picked this one. I mean, of all the spiritual gifts, why is everybody not arguing over love? Why is everybody not arguing over hospitality or administration? Uh, we're arguing over the one that's uh, loud and outlandish and interrupts church services and makes a show. And I think that that's for good reason, because it's fleshy. It's, it's fleshly when it's done wrongly, and then, uh, you know, especially when it's called the mark of true salvation. It's like saying, I mean, what if I were to get on this program and say, everybody, if you're a true Christian, then you'll have the gift of hospitality. If you're a true believer, you'll have the gift of administration. If you're a true Christian, you'll have the gift of prophecy. If you're a real believer, you'll have the, uh, the gift of teaching. I mean, how ludicrous, right? I mean, they should uh, cancel me if I'm saying that nonsense. Well, likewise, it's just as ridiculous to say that the gift of tongues is the one and only evidence of salvation, that it must be there as an essential. When Paul tells the Corinthian church, he says there's a variety and a diversity in the body of Christ, that the Spirit gives gifts according to his desire and his agenda. And Paul even literally writes, and he says, not all speak in tongues, do they? Not all prophesy, do they? Not all interpret, do they? And he's bragging on the diversity that is in the body of Jesus Christ. And then us, 2,000 years later, we're doing the opposite. We're trying to make cookie-cutter Christians, telling everybody they got to look the same, act the same, and have the same spiritual gifts. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. You know what the evidence of being saved is? Well, Paul tells us. He says, do you pass the test? He says, examine yourselves. And what is the examination? What is the test? He says, does Jesus Christ live in you? That's his question. His question is not, do you live at the church building? His question is not, do you live on the mission field? His question is not, do you live with your face buried in the Bible? His question is, does Jesus Christ live in you. He doesn't ask, do you speak in tongues? He doesn't ask, do you prophesy? He doesn't ask, have you raised somebody from the dead or healed somebody at the front of the auditorium? He says, does Jesus Christ live in you? That's the test. So all of this other stuff is a fine-sounding distraction. Uh, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, major in the majors, recognize the core gospel message. We are saved by grace through faith. So again, Vi Viola, thanks for your call today. Always great to hear from you. I hope that encourages you today. Uh, call us back anytime. All right, well, let's go now to Houston, Texas.
and we'll talk with Mark. Hey, Mark, what do you got for us today? How you doing, Andrew? Hey, great. What's on your mind? Well, I've got an upcoming Bible study from the book of Hosea 1 and 3, where it discusses his marriage to Gomer, yep. the unfaithful bride. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to discuss how God offers grace, uh, even when people are unfaithful to him. And uh, I want to know how I can jump out of Hosea, for instance, if I give him a short history lesson right. about the bride, the children, and the hope that God promises and discuss the more practical understanding of God's grace and how it applies to us. Yes, all right, I hear you, because, I mean, this is about Israel, and it's a great book of the Bible, but it's about Israel's unfaithfulness. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the purpose of the new covenant is to fix the old covenant problem. The purpose of grace is to fix the fact that we can't live under the law. The, the purpose for Jesus coming in his death, burial, and resurrection is to solve, it's to provide a solution for the lack of faithfulness. And so it's great to talk about Hosea. It's an awesome story, and uh, you know, it's a, a narrative uh, history, and uh, you, you find it as, as one of the minor prophets, and you look at uh, what's going on, it's basically describing adultery. I mean, it's describing spiritual adultery, and that is the adultery of Israel, God's chosen people. Uh, God loves them with his incredible, limitless love, and yet uh, they can't remain faithful, and they abandon him. And that's the, the old covenant story. It is rededicate, recommit. Moses comes down from the mountain. He reads everything in the law. Uh, Israel says, we will obey everything. We'll obey everything written in the law. And you know what happens. I call that the... Uh, the first promise keepers convention, right? At the bottom of Mount Sinai, that's the first promise keepers convention, and it's a total bust. Uh, and so, you know, we, we look at uh, what occurs there and we say, gosh, that sounds a lot like my Christian life. I don't always remain faithful. I'm up and down and all around. Well, the new covenant fixes the old covenant problem. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. His face is always toward us. God's not in a barbershop chair flipping round and round every time we perform poorly. So I think you can talk about uh, Hosea. You've got this unfaithful wife, uh, Gomer, and uh, uh, she leaves him. And uh, you know how the story goes. So we've got a situation that's about mercy and grace and all those wonderful things. But even that story, uh, it falls short. It falls short of the new covenant reality because we have Christ living in us. It's not just a marriage from a distance. It's not just us over here in the corner and the husband coming to visit, if you will. Uh, it is Christ in you. Uh, it is Christ in you and you in Christ. It's a spiritual union. So if you go off in the corner, uh, you take Jesus with you. <laughs> and that's what sets apart this new covenant and makes it better than the old. I mean, you had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You have Samson and Esther and Daniel and David and all these old covenant believers. And Hebrews 13 uh, says, uh, actually it's Hebrews 11, says we have something better that they walked by faith and they were sawn in two and ran around in sheepskins and goatskins and hid in caves and they ran for their lives and shut the mouths of lions and by faith they did this and by faith they did that and they were incredible but it says but they did not they did not receive what we've received and we have something better than they ever had so my point is then, even with this, uh, this idea uh, in Hosea of unfaithfulness and, and mercy and kindness and restoration and all that, that's great. It's beautiful. Uh, but there's a deeper reality, and that is wherever we go today, we take Christ with us. Wherever we go, there he is, him in us and us in him. And in fact, I would argue there's another reason that we have a better deal and that is Ephesians 6, 24. It says that we have an undying love 
for Christ. So what I'm saying is you're not unfaithful, not at heart. You have an undying love for Christ. You're a believer now. What happened to your old self? Your old self dead, buried, and gone. You're a new creation. I took out your heart of stone, God says, and I gave you a new heart and a new spirit, and I put God's spirit in you, and you'll never stop loving Jesus. Ephesians 6.24, you have an undying love for Christ. It's imperishable. So you'll never stop loving him. And I know where people go with this. I mean, basically, a lot of people say, well, you know, God will never leave us. But maybe we will wake up someday and leave God. Well, I'm saying, no, you won't. You won't. Not if you're in him. Not if you're in Christ. Not if you're a new creation. You can't leave God and you won't want to leave God because God has changed your wants. He's changed your desires. He's changed your core passions. You might get annoyed at church. You might get frustrated with church people. You might be hurt by religion. But if you have been given an undying love for Jesus, then you'll never stop loving him. And that is precisely what happened at salvation. He took out that heart of stone, put in a new living heart. He poured out his love in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So that's how I think, Mark, that you can start uh, with Hosea, tell the story, it's beautiful, it's awesome, and then say, guess what? As romantic as that is, as amazing as that mercy is, we have something greater today. It's the indwelling, it's the union with Christ. We have something unbreakable, unshakable, wow. So, Mark, I hope that encourages you today. So glad you're checking out Hosea. Call us back anytime. Great to hear from you. All right, well, let's go Let's go to Alabama, and we'll talk with Gail. Hey, Gail, what's on your mind today? Hi, Andrew. Um, yeah, I wish you could expound on something you said uh, the other week. You were in teaching in Hebrews, mm-hmm. and you made the statement that we have to be willing to get it wrong sometimes. And I think the context was, you know, our striving to do right. And, Mm. you know, certainly there are things in my personality and attitudes that I wish Jesus would change instantly. (laughs) Right, Um, right. But it's knowing of the mind. But if you could expound on the willingness to get it wrong sometimes. Sure. Yeah, I hear you, Gail. Well, this kind of, it kind of brings me back to the Garden of Eden. I mean, let's not forget what the sales pitch was. You know, was the sales pitch from Satan, hey, uh, Adam, hey, Eve, come over here and do this really bad thing. Was that the sales pitch? No. The sales pitch was, in the day you eat of this, you will be like God. See, that sounds like a good thing. I mean, who doesn't want to be like God? Come on. We call that godliness, right? So Satan's sales pitch was godliness. Come over here, eat of this fruit, and when you do, you will know good from evil. He didn't say come over here and do evil. He said come over here and get knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he was appealing to something. What was he appealing to? He was appealing to their desire to do good. Now, I'm going to say that twice because I think that it bears repeating here. He did not invite them to eat from the evil tree. He invited them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, come over here and eat of the morality tree. Come over here and eat of the ethics tree. Come over here and eat of the tree of self-improvement. Come over here and eat of the tree of sin management. And if you will eat of this tree, then you will have the blinders taken off, and you will be able to see like God sees, and you'll be able to check the boxes, good and evil, and good and evil. And you'll be able to avoid all the evil, and you'll be able to do all of the good. And that was the first sin. That's right, the first sin was trying to get more knowledge of good and evil. Wait a minute, how can that be? I thought morality and ethics were great. 
Well, it's, I guess it's better than having chaos and murder and violence in the world, but God's goal is not morality and ethics. God's goal is Jesus in you and Jesus expressed through you. And you say, well, isn't that the same thing? I mean, come on, God is good, Jesus is good. So clearly, isn't being good the same as expressing Jesus? No, it is not. Do you not see that the world can be generous? The world can have no relationship with Christ and be generous and treat people kindly and act tolerant and change their vocabulary and present themselves as educated and nice and sweet and tolerant and loving and good, and yet it's not the fruit of the Spirit because they don't have the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the Spirit when you don't have the Spirit. So our goal is not to stop all the bad stuff and do a bunch of good stuff. I mean, you can, you can get that in Mormonism. You can get that in Islam. You can get that in Buddhism. Look at all those people over there stopping the bad and doing the good. I call that country club religion. Let's all gather around the principles of morality and ethics, and let's do a bunch of good. Well, that's better, like I said, it's better than war. <laughs> it's better than chaos and violence. I'll take that for the world any day over chaos and violence. But that's not the goal of the Christian life. The goal of the Christian life is to know and express Jesus. Now, let's get back to the garden because you got two trees, not just one. I've only talked about one tree, but there's a second tree in that garden. Hello? There's the tree, first of all, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the morality tree, the ethics tree. Do you know what the second tree is called? It's the tree of life. It's the tree of life. Wow, are you kidding me? So life in Jesus is the opposite of knowledge of good and evil. So the question is, do you want morality or do you want life? Do you want ethics or do you want the life of Christ? Because they are not the same thing. And so it's almost like you got to, uh, two guys over here on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You got one guy hanging on to the good branch. He's hanging on tight to that good branch. And he looks over at the guy on the evil branch. And he says, I'm glad I'm not that guy. I'm on the good branch. And somebody says, hey, dude, you're on the wrong tree. <laughs> it doesn't matter what branch you're on. If you're on the good branch or the evil branch, it makes no difference. You're on the wrong tree. You need to be on the tree of life, life in Christ Jesus. It's not about morality. It's not about ethics. It's not, it's not about uh, some generic sense of goodness. It's about life in Jesus Christ. Now, once I realize that, then I'm walking by faith. I'm not walking by rules. I'm walking by faith and dependency on Christ who I believe is alive today living in me. Why is he living in there? Well, I mean, God could have just given me a ticket to heaven, you know. He could have given me a little slip of paper that says admit one. A little ticket to heaven and then a book, you know, a guidebook. So I've got the ticket and the book and the ticket and the book. He could throw in a building down the street. So now i got a ticket, a building, and a book. And I go to the building once a week. Is that what he did? No, he, he hung on a cross. He rose from the dead. And then he took a spiritual syringe, if you will. And he, he, he was able to just take out, siphon out the old self, siphon out who I was in Adam, and then boom, put in a new self, and then put in himself, his spirit living in us. That's salvation. Why did he do it? He gave his life for us, then he gives his life to us, and then he lives his life in and through us. And that is not about morality. It's about Jesus. It's not about ethics. It's about Jesus. It's not about sin management. It's about walking by faith, trusting the life of God inside of us. All right, so if you're going to do that, then here's the thing. You have to be willing to get it wrong. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to be willing 
to allow Jesus to inspire everything. And Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not in charge of my morality and ethics today. I'm trusting you. You are love and joy and peace and patience and self-control. You're all those things. You're my life. So I'm going to trust you today. I'm going to be led by you today. I hope you see that's like a free fall. I mean, that's like a free fall into Jesus plus nothing. That is a free fall. You are banking on something, man. When you let go of the rule keeping and you let go of the religiosity and the law-based living and you say, I'm going to do a free fall into trusting the resurrection life of Christ in me, then you're saying, I'm willing for this thing to fail. I mean, I'm willing to not understand, and I'm willing for this thing to fail, and I am banking every, it's like going all in, you know, in the casinos when they take all their chips, and they push them to the middle, and they say, this is it, I'm all in. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're saying, I'm not just going to look to Jesus for forgiveness. I'm not going to just look to Jesus for heaven. I'm going to look to Jesus as my life. Like, I'm going to take him at face value that this gospel is not just, a, a, you know, a, a trip to heaven someday and forgiveness because of his blood, but I'm going to believe the crazy verses. W- what am I talking about? Well, you, you know what I mean. The crazy verses, like the verse that says, I no longer live and Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20. That's crazy. You're saying, Paul, that just beneath your flesh and bones and everything that you've called you, that Christ lives in you. Well, if that's true, then you have a miraculous new way to live. I mean, let's put it this way. Imagine, uh, you know, I'm not very good at basketball. I've probably played uh, 200 times in my life. I'm very average, maybe even below average at basketball. But you know this guy, Steph Curry. I mean, he's a believer. Steph Curry is uh, an awesome dude. He's amazing. He's setting records and he's going to go in the Hall of Fame for sure. And I mean, he seems comfortable with half court shots. He doesn't even need the three point line. Seems like he could uh, be at the other rim shooting across the entire court and make it. He's awesome. He's amazing. Now, if I told you on public radio right now that I have had the most amazing thing happen to me, I have been infused with the life of Steph Curry, that Steph Curry now dwells in me. You would call me nuts. If, if you took what I said at face value, you would say, what is this guy talking about? He believes he's got the life of Steph Curry inside of him. So let's play with that. I mean, I step out on the NBA court my first time ever. I've got a choice, play the way that Andrew Farley plays basketball, which is not great. <laughs> or... Or let the spirit of Steph Curry uh, motivate and animate and inspire me as I play. That's my choice under this crazy scenario. Now, I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe that Steph Curry lives in me. But I do believe, and I mean just as literally, I do believe that the spirit of Christ Jesus lives inside of me. I don't think it's symbolic. I don't think it's fake. I don't think it's Bible talk. I don't think it's the way that God sees me as if he's tricking himself. I don't think the early church was willing to be tortured and killed for an analogy. I don't think the early church was tortured, dragged from their homes, used as human torches in the Colosseum. I don't think that they were willing to go through all of that for a symbol. I think that they knew that Christ literally and actually lived in them. And here's the great news. He literally and actually lives in you. So if that's true, all I'm saying is he's got this. He's got this. You don't need to be a a rule keeper. You don't need to be a perfectionist law-based liver. You can trust him because he's got this. He rose from the dead. He lives in you so that he can express his life through you. When nobody's watching and there's no religious pressure, what do you want? What I'm saying is he's changed what you want, and he has hitched his very life up to your life. 
and Christ is your life, literally and actually. Let's believe what the early church believed. No more talk of symbols and shadows and analogies and, you know, Jesus in my heart is a sweet notion for little children. No, the life of the resurrected Christ Jesus dwells in you. And if that's true, if that's true, then who needs the law to live by? Who needs rules to abide by? We can trust the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the law. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So let's trust Him. Again, Gail, I hope that helps. Uh, Reach out to us again anytime. Great to hear from you. All right, well, let's go now uh, to Canada, and we'll talk with Mary. Hey, Mary. Hi. Hi. Hey, what's on your mind today, Mary? Oops, I guess we lost Mary. We're going to have to jump over uh, to, well, we're losing, ah, let's go to Florida. We'll talk with Alexis. Hey, Alexis. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Hey, I'm doing <laughs> great. Go for it. All right. Um, I just wanted to call because, like, recently I've been watching a lot of your videos and stuff, and they've been really helping me. Yeah. So I appreciate you um, because like I've been saved for a couple of years now and I recently came out of like a really, this was a struggle. Like I honestly was like backsliding for a little bit and I've been just really trying to study, like, I guess losing your salvation. Cause some people say that you can forfeit it, so I don't really believe you can lose it, but just been trying to really have a better understanding on that. And also like what, what really is an apostate? Because some of the some parts in the Bible just make it seem like a Christian can like fall away. Right. Um, okay. So that's kind of really wondering. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it, Alexis. Thank you for calling in and trusting us with your question. Uh, you know, before we get into that, I do want to share uh, that uh, you can be a part of something new and exciting and very encouraging, and that is this new series uh, that we have. It's a series called The Grace Message, and uh, today's the first day that we are giving it to each and every supporter this month. Uh, The month is new. It's the month of October. It begins today, and this uh, series is called The Grace Message. It's a 12-part video series, uh, and it was produced in a studio uh, that is, well, you guys probably know, Right Now Media. Right Now Media is well known all over the world. And they produced uh, this new series for us called The Grace Message. And we're giving away uh, this 12 part video series as our thanks to each and every donor this month. So if you like what you're hearing on the radio broadcast, you want to dig a little deeper, see one of our finest resources that summarizes everything that we're about and encourages you. Well, uh, go to our website at andrewfarley.org. You can visit our website, and you'll find right on the homepage uh, banner there, you'll see a, a little uh, a place where you can click and, and go to the Grace Message and find out about this uh, 12-part video series. And it's our thanks. So we're giving it away to each and every donor uh, who supports the Grace Message this month. I think you're going to love it. It's one of our very best resources ever. I'm so excited to be able to give it away to each and every donor this month. It's it's just a way to say, wow, we can't do what we do without you, and we are grateful for you. So visit our website at andrewfarley.org. You can click on the Donate tab there. Again, the website is so easy to remember. It's andrewfarley.org, and of course, uh, your gift is tax deductible. We're a nonprofit Christian media ministry, and we would love to send this to you uh, with our thanks. It's called The Grace Message. Is the gospel really this good? It's a 12-part video series produced by Right Now Media. We want to put it in your hands as our thanks. So go to our website at andrewfarley.org. Now, about uh, this idea of apostasy, I mean, can you, can you forfeit your salvation? That's a simple way of saying, can you walk away? Can you give it up? Uh, and what is this apostasy? 
Well, of course, uh, you know, there's a, a man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't let anybody deceive you. The day will not come until the rebellion occurs. The man of lawlessness is revealed. The man who's doomed to destruction. Uh, you know, that's at the end of the days. And there's no evidence that guy is some believer that's turned rogue. Uh, he's a man of lawlessness. Uh, next, regarding apostasy, you might pop over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says clearly, in the later times, some will abandon the faith and following deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. I would say we're already there. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we've abandoned some pretty sound ideas of the faith. We Christians are distracted by Galatianism. We're distracted by legalism. We're distracted by the lure of sin. We're distracted by all kinds of things. But that doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. Uh, I think we're going to have to uh, fall back on the promises of God. Because, see, what's happening is pe people are taking uh, warnings, warnings that are meant for unbelievers, and they're, they're interpreting them as being for Christians who could lose their salvation. Let me give you an example. Hebrews 3.12. Uh, you know, if you Google apostasy, this would be one of the, the verses that would come up. And it's like, why? Why does this come up? Listen, it says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. What does that tell you? Well, that's an unbeliever. How do I know? Well, because believers have a new heart. This is a sinful, unbelieving heart of an unbeliever. But see, I got to know the new covenant to get this right. That's why we at the grace message, that's why we exist. That's why we're telling people about the new covenant and our new identity in Christ. If I don't know my new identity in Christ, if I don't know that I have a new heart, if I don't know that I have a new spirit, if I don't know that I'm a new creation with new desires, then what am I going to do? I'm going to read this passage, passage and go, oh, no, oh, no. What, what if that's me? What if I have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God? And God's answer is, you don't. Hello, I took out your heart of stone. I gave you a new heart. Your heart is not deceitful. Your heart is not wicked. Your heart is not sinful. And your heart is not unbelieving. You have a new heart, and Christ dwells in your heart. That's the whole point of salvation. Hello. And that's why we got to clear these things up. And that's why we're on the air six days a week telling people about their new identity in Christ because this matters. It matters because it affects the way that you relate to God. It affects the way that you see yourself. And it affects the way that you interpret your Bible because otherwise you're going to be running, running to all the warning passages going, oh, is that to me? Is that to me? Is that to me? Am I going to lose? Am I going to forfeit? Am I going to give up? And God's answer is there's three great evidences here. I mean, across the entirety of the New Testament, there's three great evidences. Number one, how forgiven are you? Totally forgiven. Then how could you lose your salvation if you're totally forgiven? I mean, again, pardon me if I'm wrong here, but my Bible says that God keeps no record of your wrongs. All right? If he keeps no record of your wrongs, then you're totally forgiven, and there's no cause for loss of salvation. You can't lose it if he keeps no record. He says he remembers your sins no more. He says he's removed them as far as the east is from the west. And he says, blessed is the man who sins. The Lord does not take into account. So if that's the truth, then you can't lose your salvation. Your sins are gone. He remembers them no more. Number two, the nature of eternal life. I mean, just look in Webster's Dictionary at the word eternal. What is eternal? Why did Jesus call it everlasting life? Why did Jesus call it eternal life? Because, newsflash, it lasts forever. And if you could interrupt that, if you could mess that up, then it wouldn't be eternal. It would be temporary life. But you can't mess it up, and you can't interrupt it. He gave you eternal life, not temporary life. 
He gave you eternal salvation, not partial salvation. You know, as I've often said, I mean, my goodness, if you if you are on the Titanic and uh, and you're going down and I'm in a lifeboat and I say, hey, come with me. But then after you're 40 minutes in the lifeboat, we're getting back to New York uh, Harbor. I get tired of your personality. I get tired of your cussing and I toss you out into the icy waters and you freeze to death. Well, then I didn't save you. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is not a temporary reprieve until you cuss too much. Salvation is not a temporary reprieve until you perform poorly. Salvation is when I deliver you safely to the shore. And likewise, what Jesus has done for us, it's called eternal life, everlasting life for a reason, uh, because it lasts forever. So number one is look how forgiven you are. Number two is look at what kind of life you have, eternal life. And then number three is God's not a liar. I mean, look at God's statements. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand. Even when you're faithless, I remain faithful. Nothing separates you from the love of Christ. All of those are statements that God makes in the New Testament. Now, if he makes those statements to us, then we have to decide, did he accidentally leave a clause out, you know, a forfeit clause? Did he really mean that nothing separates you from the love of Christ, uh, but I forgot about the forfeit thing? Does he really mean I'll never leave you, never forsake you, unless you decide to forfeit me? I mean, this language is not even in the New Testament. It's not there. We made it up. And I'll, I'll just remind us that the New Covenant is a solution to the Old Covenant problem. Remember the Old Covenant problem. I turned away from them, says the Lord, because they did not remain faithful. Sounds like they forfeited their faithfulness. That's an Old Covenant problem. It's an Old Covenant problem that is solved in the New Covenant. How does he solve it? Well, totally forgiven, eternal life, God promises never to leave, and then he puts an undying love for Jesus inside of you. So you'll never stop loving him. So I got to say, the New Covenant is a beautiful solution to the Old Covenant problem, don't you think? So what should we be ministering today? Well, there's a beautiful passage in 2 Corinthians 3 that answers that. What should every Christian book contain? What should we be bragging on from every pulpit in America and around the world? What should every Christian radio ministry be centered on? Well, Paul tells us that we're qualified. We're qualified to minister one thing, and here it is. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he has made us qualified as ministers of the new covenant, not of the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So what are we qualified to teach? What are we qualified to preach and share on the airwaves and in books and across America and around the world? We're qualified to share one message. It says he's made us qualified or competent to share one message, the new covenant. We're not qualified to say, look at me, the rule keeper. We're not qualified to say, look at me, the law abider. We're not qualified to say, look at me and my obedience. We're qualified to point to the obedience of the one, Jesus Christ himself, the new covenant. It's our one and only beautiful message of grace. For more information on the broadcast ministry of Dr. Andrew Farley, please visit andrewfarley.org. That's andrewfarley.org. Join us next time as we invite you to celebrate the grace message with Dr. Andrew Farley. This program is sponsored by your generous financial support.